Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Today I am talking to a detransitioner by the name of Sophia Galvin, and she is going to tell us her story of transitioning from the time she was a teenager to detransitioning a couple years ago. And then an amazing part of her story is becoming a Christian a year ago. And so she is going to tell us about the process, which is very disturbing and very troubling in a lot of ways, but so important to know how this is happening to young people today. Um, and then she is going to enlighten us also about kind of the psychological turmoil she was going through. And then she'll talk to us about receiving the gospel and understanding that in Jesus, there is true freedom. She'll also give us some recommendations some advice at the end of this episode for how we as Christians can approach these issues and speak the truth in love to people who identify as transgender. Amazing, amazing conversation. Because she shares so much amazing insight and wisdom, I really encourage you to share this with everyone in your life, whether they're a Christian or not, but especially those in your church, especially your pastor. We'll also link some past episodes that we have done on this subject in the description of this episode. So if you want to know more about this subject, where this ideology comes from, how I think um, we can approach it truthfully and gracefully as Christians, you can go listen to those after this conversation. But you are absolutely going to love Sophia and appreciate her vulnerability and her testimony so much. So we'll go ahead and get right into it after I tell you about Good Ranchers, our sponsor for this show. It's American Meat delivered right to your front door. Support American farms and ranches by going to goodranchers.com slash Allie. You'll get a discount when you do. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie. Sophia, thank you so much for joining us. For those who may not know, can you just tell us a little bit first about who you are? Yes. So my name is Sophia. Um, I'm a Christian and I've been saved for about a year now. Um, so at 17 years old, I made the decision to transition to become a man. And um, it was a horrible decision. And so at 20 years old, I made the decision to then detransition back to female. Um, and then after a year of, you know, just not having any resources and not knowing what to do, I ended up giving my life to Christ. And it's been a year since then. Wow. Let's go to before you were 17, pre-transition. What made you feel like you were the opposite sex and that you should try to present as a male? A lot of it, um, me personally, like obviously, and you can understand, um, you know, being, being a, a woman in society and not like necessarily from a feminist sense, but just some of the things that I would experience, like, you know, having men regular be regularly be predatory, but also, you know, how the culture has this, um, you know, how we over-sexualize girls. I just, I felt really uncomfortable in my body and mm. also just certain things that had happened to me in my life. I just felt really uncomfortable in myself. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, from from a young age, I also had struggled with um, same-sex attraction, which had mm. led me towards going into, really going into the LGBT community mm. and becoming indoctrinated. Um, I actually wanted to be an LGBT activist right before uh, making the decision to transition. So when did the discomfort in your body start, if you can remember? Really, truly, when I started to say, you know, this is gender, well, you know, thinking to myself, like, this is gender dysphoria was, that was at 17. Oh, okay. um, now, when I was young, I had like kind of times where I would be sort of, I guess you could say a tomboy. Yeah. Um, but it was really at 17 when, when it be, when it began for me that All I started right. to feel uncomfortable. So you kind of maybe were a tomboy or maybe you were interested in things that weren't considered traditionally female and your parents, how did they react to that when you were young? Did they have a reaction at all? No, it was like a normal thing and yeah. I grew out of it too. Yeah. Like, I mean, it was just, I, it was like around fifth grade. And then after that, I was like very feminine. Yeah. So 
it it's kind of, and of course like i mean i think i had times where i would wear what was it flannels when yeah. that would be popular yeah that was about as masculine as i would go like i would often wear dresses i would wear i started like experimenting with makeup from a really young age so i was always very feminine um yeah. it was kind of something that that happened all of a sudden and a big part of it was um for myself personally was confusion surrounding entering a same-sex relationship okay and what was before we get into that because i am interested in like kind of what those feelings were for you because i'm sure that there are people listening who either they have their child is experiencing the same thing or they've experienced the same thing so i think that your experience can give a lot of clarity but what was your upbringing like were you raised a christian no i actually i wasn't raised a christian um you know i in my home, it was just um, like very, I, I mean, I guess you could say like nowadays a, a, a normal American home. Yeah. Like I wasn't raised push, Christian. I never had Christian beliefs pushed on me. Um, you know, being being LGBT wasn't necessarily something that was, um, how do I say, like there, there were gay people in my family. Um, so LGBT influences were something that, um, I had in my life from a young age. Uh, so I, I, I was never even raised a Christian. I was never really pushed. I mean, you know, I was baptized as a little girl and mm. I went a few times with my grandma to church, but honestly, I, a Christian is probably the last thing that I ever thought I would ever become. <laughs> yeah. And, and when did you start feeling like you were attracted to women? That happened to me from a very young age, um, starting at around, I mean, I, I think I would say six years old. Um, and it was something that made me always extremely uncomfortable, but also something that I felt like I wasn't able to voice to people. Mm. Um, so for, for years, I just was very silent and secretive about it. Um, and you, you had mentioned about being a Christian. I was never a Christian. But I had always believed in, in like, that there was a God. Mm. And so I would speak to God. And, like, I remember right before, like, officially coming out and saying, you know, I'm I'm gay or what I said at the time. Um, I remember crying and, and asking God to, to take it away from me because I, I, I didn't want to have to live that kind of life. Mm -hmm. And how did that develop in your teenage years you were uncomfortable with it from an early age but you also said that your feelings of dysphoria or feeling like you had dysphoria were connected to your feelings for other women so tell me about that kind of internal conflict and why you think those things are connected yes so well one thing i guess is important to mention is i went to an all-girls school mm. so in the midst of hormonal craziness I was only around girls and I also had experienced same-sex attraction from a young age um so for myself when I made the decision to to come out and I mean I changed you know we'll just say coming out as same-sex attracted for the sake of conversation um you know immediately I just felt like I don't want people to have to experience what I always experienced growing up having to be ashamed and having to keep my mouth shut and pretend, you know, like this isn't something that I actually struggle with. So that's when I really began to like, um, how do I say, like, I really became interested in the whole agenda that, that people are pushing now, like um, kind of forcing these beliefs and these values onto other people. And how do I say like, um, that, like the LGBT ideology, like I wanted to push it really hard. And so I think it was that indoctrination um, along with when I entered into a same sex relationship, you know, because we were two women and like kind of the perception of, of people outside of that, there was, there was, you know, we had some negative experiences. And I guess because of some things that I had e experienced in my life, specifically from men, I felt like I had to take on kind of like a, a protective role. Mm. And that was something that really had pushed me towards um becoming a man and it was other things like it, i would say it was kind of a culmination of just being uncomfortable living as a woman for so many years but that was like the final 
push, yeah. obviously, along with the LGBT indoctrination in the culture at the time. And where did that LGBT indoctrination come from? And when you say the ideology, like what exactly do you mean? Kind of what ideas were you hearing and that that made you feel that way? I guess, you know, of course, I, I always want to make sure that everything I, I, I say, you know, is is kind. Um obviously, obviously to an extent, because I know that I have to stand on what the truth of what the Bible says. But I guess, you know, the, the belief that if, if you're same sex attracted, um, it it means that it's something that, you know, you you can never get away from, like, it's something you can never be set free from. This is who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it can't be changed. And there's nothing you can do about it. So you just have to accept it and move on. So that's kind of what I would, yeah. not even just for same-sex attraction, but when it came to to gender dysphoria as well, which was a huge influence in what um, led me towards transitioning, thinking that that was the only way. But um, what I would say more specifically, like specific things, I guess you could say social media, internet, um, the culture at my my school had changed a little bit. But I guess, honestly it didn't really come from one specific place. It was just society and in general as a whole um, at the time and obviously more so now. And this was, you were a teenager. What, what years about? 2017. Okay. So 2017, 2018. Okay. Gotcha. And so, yeah, I was a teenager, like, you know, 2010, 2008, and it just wasn't quite as prevalent, whether you were a Christian or not, it's just not something that was really talked about. It was still kind of taboo to even like mention the fact that someone struggled with those kinds of feelings. And so I imagine even just fast forward eight to 10 years and it's kind of ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And as you said, it's kind of being pushed. You have to accept this. You have to celebrate this. You have to embrace this. This is now part of like your immutable identity. It probably is really difficult if you are kind of struggling with those feelings, not knowing where to place them, and you do find acceptance or what you think is acceptance from this community, of course, that's going to become who you are. It, of course, it's going to be like the ideology and the idea that you push because that helps you feel kind of most comfortable, right? Yes, I completely agree. And something really, really key that I think you mentioned was identity. And I think a large issue with the culture right now is a lack of identity and specifically a a lack of identity in Christ, which has allowed me to find freedom. You know, now I'm not saying that we should push uh, God on people in any way, but I would definitely say if I would have known about about Jesus and what, you know, his his love and his spirit is capable of from a young age and even even if. At the time when I was struggling with gender dysphoria, if someone would have came up to me and say, Jesus could set you free of that, I would have never gone down the path that I went down. Yeah. And I want to talk about that a lot more. I do kind of want to hear a little bit more about your path first um, from, you know, uh, same-sex attraction to gender dysphoria to transitioning. I think it's so important just to hear like the specific parts of your story because that helps people who are going through this or know someone who are going through this to know what to like look for, to know what the process looks like. Um, and so tell us, you were 17, you had already been as, in a same-sex relationship. You kind of told us what that was like. Tell us a little bit more about the kind of realization, if you will, that maybe you were struggling with gender dysphoria and then how that led you to then transition? Okay. So um, I wouldn't say it was necessarily like there's a specific time that I could pinpoint where it's like, I just had this big epiphany, like, wow, this is who I am. It wasn't necessarily like that. It was more so like, it was more so over, over a period of months. And so like for me, I was always a very good student. Um, a very, I I like to research things. So of course, what did I do? I went on the internet and researched it. I looked up the, the DSM-5, um, diagnostic, uh, label or or diagnostic criteria, I think it was. And what I was experiencing was in line with it. I had, I had gender dysphoria for, for more than six months. And 
Um, you know, I, I was a tomboy when I was little and I liked things that were m masculine. Um, so it was like things like that. It was going on, on places. I can't say exactly what places and what websites I went on, but mm -hmm. I imagine there were something like Reddit, Tumblr, wherever I could find really. And, you know, like one thing for me specifically is that my breasts just made me extremely uncomfortable. Mm. And when I, when I looked, um, it was like, oh, that's, that's like a, a thing. Like if your breasts make you uncomfortable, that means that you're trans. And so it was all of these things that I think all women experience and like people in general, I think that it's normal, you know, growing up to sometimes feel uncomfortable in your body. And because of all of the changes going on, and especially like, I was just about to graduate from high school. That's a really big life change. Yeah. Um, but I would say it was, it was mostly uh, going online and looking at those things and seeking that affirmation from other people and confirmation from other people that yes this is in fact true and who I am and at this point did most of your friends and your parents know that you considered yourself gay yes and were they mostly accepting of that like your parents they were fine no, no one minded yeah no. You've mentioned a couple times in passing, and it's totally up to you whether you kind of want to get specific on this, that you had, um, that there were some negative experiences in your past that made you just not really want to be a girl. I don't know if it's because mm -hmm. of like the vulnerability that is innate in femininity and innate in a woman's body, but um, if you could talk a little bit more, if you're comfortable with kind of like what you mean. Yeah. So, I mean, one, one thing that I, I do feel comfortable elaborating on is I, I, I grew up in, in Miami, which is a very big city. It's a really crazy city. Um, so it's normal being 13, 14 years old, walking down the street and you'll have a, someone honk their horn at you and shout profanities and just say nasty things. You'll just be walking and someone will stare at you and it's a normal thing. Now, that might be a normal thing in other places as well. I'm not saying like it's only in Miami. Yeah. But it's something going to other places that I noticed it wasn't really like as as heavy. And I will say this, I mean, at the school that I went to, um, it was a very small school. It was 400 students. It was a really good school academically, um, but it was small. So we would run laps in the parking lot. And I remember there was one time that there were men recording us as we were running. And the school officials didn't do anything about it. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was just things, it was things like that, that just like, you know, I, I felt like I, I couldn't establish boundaries. I felt like I was always at like the will of whatever, you know, whatever men is around, man is around. I, I also, yeah. you know, I, I went to um, dual enrollment when I was 15. I started going to dual enrollment. So I started taking college classes. And so it was normal for 30 year old men to flirt with me. And when I say, Hey, like I'm 15, I'm uncomfortable. They're like, well, I don't care. And I'm like, well, I do. That's, that's pretty odd yeah. for you to, to flirt with me at this age. And yeah. not, it wasn't even just that though. It was yeah. also just the, the over sexual culture, like uh, in, in the world in general, like how women have, we have to over sexualize ourselves and like, as if our bodies are like what give us value when it's not yeah yeah i think a lot of people don't realize or maybe a lot of men don't realize and certainly i'm not like a man hater anything like that so it's this is not necessarily a negative part about men it's just true that you can't fully understand what it's like to always be like potential prey. Now that doesn't mean that I am like paranoid and I think like every guy is a predator. That's not what it's about. But when you are talking about predation, it is typically women and children who are the prey just because we are physically weaker. We are physically more vulnerable. Women just have to think more about how we dress, how we present ourselves, our tone of voice, what we say, how we like use our eyes, uh, where we are, how we're walking. Like if we're looking behind our back, that's just true. That's a fact in a way that most men simply don't. So I'm not saying that that is like the only thing that drove you to think that you need to transition, but I can at least empathize with the constant burden of feeling like, oh, if I could just not be objectified or if I could just not worry about that, if I could just not be potential prey, that would feel maybe like a relief. I don't know. Yes, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, 
I guess just like wanting, like you said, like just wanting to feel comfortable, you know, it's going safe. out into the world. Yeah. But, you know, transitioning to become a man doesn't necessarily solve that issue. <laughs> so. Right. Right. So, yeah, <laughs> tell me um, a little bit more about that. After you looked online, you went on Reddit and Tumblr, which is like a common theme that I hear when talking to detransitioners. They're looking for, as we all do when it comes to different things that we're like thinking through or worried about we seek affirmation somewhere anywhere and you will absolutely find that when it comes to gender identity on places like tumblr and reddit and you will hear like a lot of things like what you're saying like the smallest thing outside of traditional femininity means that you're trans and so yes. um yeah and it, you can you can comment on that if you want to or you can go ahead and go into like how you went from that feeling and those like online searches to actual transition Yes. Yeah, so actually, I don't know why when when you were speaking, I actually remembered an, another point that I wanted to make, which I think um, is important when discussing gender dysphoria is that I also uh, simultaneously at the time was struggling with a lot of mental health issues and had a history of of struggling with mental health issues, you know, being suicidal and and self-harming. There were times where sometimes I would have to go to the hospital um, because I just had so much anxiety. I didn't know how to like I, I didn't know how to calm myself, right. you know. So I went. I went to a therapist. I got on psychiatric medication. And this is seventeen. It, still, you're about seventeen years old. This was a little bit before, before. seventeen. Okay. It was at seventeen or like around that time that I was like, okay, I'm not taking psychiatric drugs. I'm not going to therapy because it's not helping me. Yeah. Like it. I just like for me, I just never understood. I'm like, okay. You can give me all of the coping mechanisms in the world, but how is that supposed to like actually heal me, heal mm. me and help me? It's nothing against having coping mechanisms, but I could never actually find healing in any of that. And mm. so like, you know, being at a loss, trying to heal myself with, you know, secular therapy and secular psychology and all of these things, I was looking for like anything that would help me with, with my, my mental health and my mental issues that I was experiencing. And so that was also something else that that I believe led me towards um, experiencing gender dysphoria. Or I guess you could say rapid onset gender dysphoria. However you wanna, however you wanna say it. Um, but like the culmination of other mental health issues. Yeah. And so when you did decide that you were struggling with gender dysphoria, and I'm guessing you went to, did you also go to a separate psychologist then to address your gender dysphoria? No. You didn't. So how did you, how did someone kind of confirm to you, yep, you're trans and we need to get you down a path of surgery? By giving me testosterone. Was it the same psychologist that you had? Or how did No, that I went to plan, I went to Planned Parenthood. Oh, you went to Planned Parenthood with your parents or? No, I went, I went at 18. Oh, you went, went at 18. Okay. So you went to Planned yeah, so, Parenthood at 18. Did you have to have like a recommendation from a psychologist or anyone who said, yep, she's trans? No, you just no. went to Planned Parenthood. And I think, I guess, I don't really exactly remember the exact timeline at the time. I might have gone back to a psychiatrist or something, mm. but I just read my medical records recently. I was on um, an antidepressant and they were, they were aware of that when I went there. Um, but no, all I had to do was sit in the chair, have someone talk to me, you know, giving me all of the details of what's going to happen. And they did my blood work. And when my blood work was okay, they just gave me the testosterone on the next visit. Wow. So they gave you the testosterone and did they have like some regimen for you or they're like okay you need to come back so we can make sure that things are going okay or like here's our plan of action like how did that work i i i stopped going to planned parenthood after two months and then ended up going to an endocrinologist okay but i believe what they and what most people do and what most endocrinologists do um is every three months they do blood work but we inject ourselves um i actually had a really big fear of needles and I remember, so let me backtrack. So after the original consultation appointment where they did my blood work, it was the next appointment, which was maybe like a month later that I got the testosterone. And so they assisted me in self-injection. 
And I remember I was literally like sitting there, like I've al- I've always been afraid of needles. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's not just, you know, with this, like I've always just generally been afraid of needles and not like needles. Like I would, I would pass out um, at, at the pediatrician's office when I was young. Uh, yeah. uh, Cause I just didn't like needles. Mm-hmm. So I remember sitting there and them like, just, you know, I remember being like, I, I don't want to inject myself. Like I'm scared. Like I, I don't like needles, all this stuff. She's like, it's okay. We'll just sit here and until you can do it. And I like, I just sat there for like 30 minutes until I was like, you know what, if this is going to help me, I'm going to do it. And so I ended up injecting myself. Yeah. Um, but it's self-injection and every three months blood work. And, That's it. Okay. And then you started seeing an endocrinologist and what was that process like? That honestly was a worse process. Um, so I was on 50 milligrams of testosterone at Planned Parenthood. When I went to the endocrinologist, um, he said, okay, we'll, we'll put you on 100 milligrams because that's a man's dosage. That w- that, those were his little world words. His and literal and words. you are like, how, how tall are you? How much do you weigh at this point? I, I'm, I've always been tall. So I'm, I was 5'10", but I was very thin. So like 130, yeah. 140. And you're still a woman, you know, even if you, I mean, even yeah. if you did have the same dimensions as a man, you're still not a man. And so a man's dosage is going to be higher. So when you heard that, when he was like, here's a man's dosage for you, little lady, you were just like, okay. I was just like, I, I literally remember that visit. I, I felt depressed. Yeah. Like I, I, I don't know. I was just like in the midst of a lot of depression. I was just like, Okay. Like, I was just like, okay, like, if it was going to make me feel better, okay. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't really consciously think about, okay, like, is this going to be bad? Like, and also another thing is that, you know, I had gotten a little bit into into drugs. And so I was smoking marijuana. Um, and he even noted on the medical files that I consumed small amounts of marijuana weekly. So I, I don't see how, how you're supposed to give someone who's who you know is consuming small amounts of marijuana weekly testosterone as well. I mean, I would wonder what are even the, like when, when you, when you combine it, what are the ramifications mentally? Yeah. Um, but on that level of testosterone, it, it was like literal, it was, it was like I was living through actual hell and Mm -hmm. I didn't understand how to contain myself, how to control myself. I had a lot of anger, uh, frustration, um, You know, and also like, I, my libido, I want to say this in the right way. Um, Like I I had an increase in sexual urges that made me extremely uncomfortable as well. Um, And it led to overly sexual behavior, which I now completely regret. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about after you put on that much testosterone by the endocrinologist, tell us a little bit more about like the physical changes. And was there also, well, for, let me start with that. And then I'll ask my second question about your psychological state. Um, how, how quickly did your body start changing? Honestly, it was really quickly. Um, I started seeing a change in my voice as quickly as two months into testosterone. Um, my body also changed very quickly. Um, I mean, it was all, it was all just very rapid, which felt great at the time because I'm getting what I want or what I think I want. So is there like a Um, euphoria that comes from like seeing and feeling those physical changes? Definitely. Because it's like, you know, you, you, so first initially you start dressing like a man and you put on the chest binder and you do all of these things. And so and you're going you've out been into doing the that. World. You'd been doing chest binder and dressing like yes. a guy. Did you take on a new name too? Yes, I took okay. on a new name as well. You know, and and so I'm I'm already living as a man, right? And so I want to be perceived as a man, not only just because of you know that's how I want to be perceived, but it's also safer when you're perceived as a man. For example, going into the men's bathroom, and so it it did like. It, it did make me very happy at first and very euphoric to see the changes. Um, I would say after like about, about for the first, I would say like maybe year. Um, but after that, things kind of changed. But yeah. And how did you feel when you were, when you decided that you wanted to present as a guy 
if someone like misgendered you so-called, like called you she or her or called you Sophia, what would your reaction be? It, it was like, well, well, first off, I mean, it depended. Like if it was someone I knew, I would go off on them. If it was someone I didn't know, like let's say I'm out at the store, I would just be quiet. I wouldn't say anything because it, it would just like make me so anxious. Um, not necessarily because it's like, oh, you're misgendering me, which of course I, I took issue with, but like I would worry for, for my actual safety being in, in those places because, you know, what if then, you know, someone thinks I'm like weird and this and that, and then someone beats me up or, you know, I would have all of these thoughts going through my head. Um, so always it was something horrible, not just from a standpoint of just not wanting to be misgendered, but also like fear of, of some sort of violence, whether or not the, the violence, uh, the fear of violence was actually a, a real one or just a perceived one. Yeah. Do you think that is what then motivated you kind of like the misgendering and still sometimes being perceived as a girl to go ahead and get, um, surgery? Yes. I mean, honestly, at that time I wasn't like, I wasn't really perceived as a girl as a girl ever. Um, I never had that, that issue. Um, mm. well, let me not say never, there were times, um, yeah. but it wasn't as bad as when I first transitioned. But what really led me towards removing my breasts was the fact that I hated chest binding. Mm. It was extremely uncomfortable. You know, painful. I would, let's say, yes, painful. They, they market it as a safe. And I mean, I'll say this, when I first started chest binding and like, I was going to work. Uh, almost full time. I was going to school almost full time. I had so much stress and all of these things going on. I went to the hospital three times in one week. And I really believe that it was because of the the pressure that the chest binder put on my lungs. Yeah. Um, it it was it was just horrific. And it would, you know, it would limit how often I could go out. Like let's say I went and I worked an eight hour shift at work, I'd have to go home so I could take it off. So it limited my mobility. It, it it limited what I could do. It limited my comfort comfortability, and that was a huge factor. And I I would say the number one factor probably in me having my breast removed. And also just you know when I would l look at myself in the mirror, you know, um, I I would just pick apart all of the parts of myself. You know, yeah, I, I look really masculine now, but you know, there's still this. There's still this. There's still this. There's still this that I don't like. And, you know, I felt like, but if I remove my breasts, I'll, I'll, I'll feel better. Like, that'll be the point when I'll feel better. You'll and, you know, even though like I'll a have a real man. Yeah, exactly. So, the, yeah, th those were, were my motives for, for getting top surgery or yeah. double mastectomy. Yeah. So you were on hormones and your voice started lowering. Did you get, and you talked about like your increased libido and aggression and anger, which makes sense with like huge doses of testosterone. Um, did you get, was it like body hair? Does your kind of bone structure change like in your face and your shoulders? Yes. And like, like glory to God, a lot of it has changed since then. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I had very broad shoulders. I was originally like very not very skinny, like not unhealthily skinny, but I was like a skinny, tall girl. Yeah. Um, and so the testosterone, it did, it made my shoulders broader. You know, um, I gained a lot of weight in my midsection. Like I, I it took away the curves that I had. Yeah. Um, and it, it just, a lot of body hair, facial hair, um, trying to, to think. Yeah, those those were those were mostly uh, the the physical changes that I experienced as a result of the testosterone. And then, so how long were you on testosterone before you decided to get a double mastectomy? A little more than a year, uh, um, maybe a year and three months. And was it how how what, what what was that process like? Like, was it the endocrinologist, or how do you make that decision? Um. So I just went to a, a local surgeon um, who specializes in these types of surgeries, not double mastectomies, but gender affirming. Yeah, quote unquote. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I went to one of these specialists and 
we had been kind of conversing back and forth since like since immediately after I started testosterone, but I had so much going on that it was kind of delayed a little bit. Um, at some point, uh, you know, I was really getting serious about it. And so all that I had to do was get a letter from a gender therapist. Um, so I Googled online gender therapists online that give you your surgery letter after like one visit. I Googled something like that wow. and a list popped up. And so I clicked on, on one, he, he doesn't even practice here, which now I've found out is extremely illegal. Um, <laughs> but he doesn't, he didn't even practice here. And so like, I had just been talking to him a little bit about some of my life experiences. He was like, do you, do you think that that could be, you know, why you experience uh, gender dysphoria? And I went off on him because mm. I'm like, what? Oh you're, yeah. You're, you're not gonna supposed try to say that. Yeah. No. Well, especially I'm, I'm like a year on testosterone. How are you going to tell me that my dysphoria is made up? No, I'm not going to listen to you. You felt like that's you what know, he because- was saying. He was saying, do you think that these negative experiences in your life could have caused dysphoria? And what, from what I yeah. understand, like you're not really supposed to say that. You're only supposed to say that it's totally innate and true to who you absolutely are. So you felt like he was questioning that. Yes, I felt like he was, he was questioning that. Uh, definitely. And it, it even made me feel nervous because now I realized, yeah, he was right. That, that was the reason why I experienced gender dysphoria. Um, you know, so it was me being met with reality that I didn't want to be met with. I mean, obviously I've been on testosterone for more than a year. How am I supposed to go back? There's no, there's no way back. So, you know, these weren't conscious thoughts that I had my immediate reaction was you're transphobic and if you don't give me the letter then i'm gonna report you or something yeah <laughs> or something like, like that. i feel like that probably happens often which is why there are doctors that will just be like here's your letter i mean no skin off their back they feel yep yeah well i mean he ended up giving me my letter the threat worked right. yeah and <laughs> it's just like it's crazy how how that is allowed um, but I, I completely agree. And yeah. I, I think that the medical professionals need to stand more firm um, on this issue for sure. But so how, how typical, before we get into like what the process is like and getting a mastectomy, how typical is your story of transitioners of you're 18 years old, you go to Planned Parenthood, no recommendation, just based on your word, you get hormones, you go to endocrinologist again, like I guess no real recommendation, you get on that much testosterone and then you go to gender therapist who doesn't even know you and then you go to the surgeon based on the gender therapist recommendation who does not know you and then you get an irreversible surgery is that typical of the so-called transition process for young people i mean honestly i would say from people that i have spoken to um and known personally and stories that I've read on the the detransition Reddit, people also that I've known, yes, I think that it is a an unnecessarily fast process for a lot of people. Now, are there maybe doctors that that wait a little bit and you know try and see if the child is conscious of the decision? That could be so as well. But also, I mean when we look into the gender affirming care model just in itself, it doesn't matter how long you affirm someone for, it's not going to to limit like them actually like genuinely thinking, huh, is, is this, is this actually like, is this actually good for me? Like, should I actually be doing this? So even putting those, those pauses or we'll wait three months. Cause I have heard that, you know, Oh, after the initial consultation, wait three months and then we'll start you. I mean, like for me, in the position that I was in, and I feel like a lot of young people and people are like this in general who are who are seeking these treatments, I was willing to say whatever I needed to say and do whatever I needed to do to get that testosterone and to get that surgery because I was led to believe that it was like it was gonna save me. Like I'm gonna feel so much better after it. Yeah. Um yeah. And then so you went to this gender surgeon who specialized in what is typically referred to as top surgery, double mastectomy. 
tell me what that process was like. You brought him the letter of recommendation from this gender therapist and they said, okay, you're good to go. Basically, I then got my, um, I think, was there a consultation after that? I believe then there was like maybe another consultation in person. And so then I had my surgery and that honestly, the the whole surgery process was horrible. Um, yeah. It was an outpatient facility. It wasn't in a hospital. So if something would have happened to me, like, I don't, I don't know what would have happened. Um, and, and not only that, so I, I get there that morning, like around five, 6 AM. Um, and so then immediately it's time for my surgery. And so then I wake up after the surgery. I'm like, okay, I had never had surgery before. Um, and so I wasn't allowed to stay. There wasn't any like um, place where you stay the night. I was immediately driven home. Wow. Um, I was told by the nurse, like I just woke up and the only person there was the nurse. Um, so your parents, and, uh, they weren't a part of this? Yeah, they, they were. I want to try and include them as little as, as possible just because of all of the controversy surrounding all of this stuff. Um, but yes, my, my parents were, were a part of it. Um, but the the nurse she um she was there with me and she was the only one that was there out of all of the medical professionals and she she was like okay you need to go to the bathroom before you go and mind you I'm like I'm just getting off of anesthesia I'm like go to the bathroom I'm like oh okay and so when I couldn't go to the bathroom she was like okay let me inject you with something so that you are able to go to the bathroom because after anesthesia some of your body systems turn off so yeah Then I want to, you know, so then I'm injected with something that forcibly, you know, is, is to force me to go to the bathroom. Um, I had a horrible urge to urinate, but I couldn't go. And so then I ended up. They didn't like even use a catheter. Like I've had two C-sections and they just, you know, that's what they do because you can't go to the bathroom. So I didn't even know that sometimes they inject you with something that just basically makes you want to pee, but does it actually let you pee? That sounds terrible. Right after, she's like, okay, we're going to get the catheter. I'm like, what? And she's like, don't worry. It'll feel better after. I'm like, (laughs) okay, (laughs) "Okay, I guess. I'm like, you can't. I mean, I just woke up from surgery. I don't really know exactly how how it works. But I mean, am I expected to be able to use the restroom like 30 minutes after waking up? I don't think so. Yeah. You know, so so that that's kind of questionable. Um. But no, I, I, I completely agree. And it was, it was very traumatizing. And I even, so after that, I was driven home and, you know, I ended up having to go to the hospital uh, because I still couldn't go to the bathroom. Thankfully, though, when I got to the hospital, I was able to go and then they looked at my bladder to see if it was still full and it wasn't. So then I was able to go home. But if not, I would have had to have had another catheter inserted in me. Wow. And so what was the recovery like what was it like when you first looked in the mirror and you realized okay they're gone my literal first reaction when I looked into the mirror and like officially was able to see my my chest uh you know because for for a little while after the surgery you know there's a lot you put like um bandages on and there's like little metal that that covers the nipples and so immediately after just being able to see uh, what I looked like, I thought this did not help me. That was, that was like oh my, my immediate thought. And I was just, I looked in the mirror. I was like, this did not help me. Like, because you literally, still I felt like you now. weren't masculine enough or it just like your, your depression didn't go away. My depression didn't go away. You know, and also that not, not feeling masculine enough because I'm like, okay, well, I don't have breasts now, but I still have hips. <laughs> You know, like I still have a waist. I I still, you know, I still don't have like huge muscles. So, you know, it's like to what end? Yeah. And so it was at that point that I started dressing more femininely. Mm. Um, After your mastectomy. Yep. Interesting. I started dressing more femininely. You want to know what's crazy is that, and we could get more into this um, if you want to, but. Throughout the entire process with my endocrinologist, he was always pushing me to keep continuing in the process. Like when I started testosterone, he was like, you need to change your gender marker because if you don't change your gender marker, then I can't read your your labs accurately. So you need to change it and you need to do this and you need to do that. When are you going to do this? So 
after I got the top surgery or the double mastectomy, um, he was like, it, this was like two months after. And mind you, I, I, I had that conscious thought, this did not help me. I also had the conscious thought, I'm never getting surgery again because it's horrible. Mm. Um, well, that's good. And I'm so, glad that you, ha- I'm so glad that you had that thought because I mean, the other surgeries that can come with the hysterectomies and what they call bottom surgery, I mean, that's even more invasive and more lifelong consequences that you'd be dealing with. I completely agree. Well, you want to know what he asked me? Not asked me, told me. He said, well, no, I guess it was a question, but it, it was very coercive. He was like, um, okay, so when are you getting a hysterectomy? This is the first time he saw me after getting my breast removed. And you're like 19 like, at this point, 18, 19? Yeah, I'm 19 years old. And I was like, and he's a he's a male doctor too, and it's just me and him. So imagine like he's, and again, not in like any sort of like trying to push a feminist agenda, but he's an yeah, older yeah. man. Like, And even if it was a woman too, you're an older medical professional or just a medical professional in general. Let's take all of it out of it. Yeah. trying to make me make me feel like I have to do certain things. Right. Um, but he was like, I, I, he was like, yeah, so when are you getting a hysterectomy? I was like, I'm not getting a hysterectomy. I was like, I was like, no, no way. I, I mean, I didn't tell him I regretted the surgery because I didn't tell anyone that yeah. at that point. But I was like, I'm not getting a hysterectomy. What? Yeah. And he was like, if you don't get a hysterectomy, you're going to get ovarian cancer. And I was like, Oh, because like, of, of the like, testosterone? Hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. I bet they didn't tell so you I, that at Planned Parenthood when they started you on the hormone treatment. No, I mean, they might have. Did I listen? Yeah. No. I mean, did they tell me? Probably not. Was it maybe listed in some sort of contract Pamphlet, that I signed? Yeah. Possibly. Possibly. Did I look at it? No. No. Right. I did not. Actually, they actually hand out pamph- uh, like these little packets from the local LGBT organization, giving all of, of the, the information on what to expect. All that I remembered was the little sheet that's part of the, I believe it's part of the WPATH standards of mm-hmm. all of the effects that I would see. And they were all good and po- positive things to me at the time, right? Like facial hair, voice deepening. That's the only thing that I ever remembered. And I actually pinned it on my wall. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know that it would cause ovarian cancer. I thought, oh, there's there's no, there's no harmful side effects. Right. That's what I thought. I'm like, there's nothing, no, there's nothing bad to this. And if anyone wanted to tell me there was, I'm like, no, don't tell me that. Yeah. Don't tell me that. Right. You know, but he told me that he was like, oh, you'll get ovarian cancer. And like trying to push me to get the hysterectomy. I was yeah. like, then I get ovarian cancer. I, I, I probably said it as bluntly as that. Yeah. And so then he tried to put me on some sort of medication to, um, like help against ovarian yeah prevent it i guess um but it would cause me to get periods which was also another reason why i transitioned was because i hated my periods they were very painful um i mean and i mean you know i mean i i've now grown to appreciate my monthly cycle but yes um, that's not to say that it's not also frustrating sometimes yeah (laughs) Um, of course but yeah, so I was like, I'm not, uh, I'm not taking that. I don't want to get periods. And so that was the end of that. And if I would have gotten the hysterectomy, I would have been a lifelong medical patient. Yeah. So makes sense as to why he would have wanted me to get one. Exactly. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And I think it is like, it's ideology. Yes, for some people, I think that there's some people who think that they are well-intentioned. They think that they're truly helping people. They think they're being empathetic. For some people, it's power. For some people, it's perversion and paraphilia. As we've talked about it from a lot of different angles. And if people want to know about WPATH and like where they get their research, they can listen to my interview with Genevieve Glock, who has done a lot of research in this area. It is, But no matter what the motivation is, it is leading to lifelong harm of young people. Even if Planned Parenthood had explicitly told you this can cause ovarian cancer, you're still 18 years old. Your frontal lobe still isn't developed. Even if they told you every single possible side effect, you, that young, cannot even be really held responsible for that because you don't have the decision-making capacity to even be able to understand the long-term implications of the thing that you're doing in the moment that you think and you have been told is going to alleviate your depression, right? 
Yep, I completely agree. Well, let me ask you a question. You've, you've been to college before, right? Yes. How many times did you change your degree or your, your, your desire for a major? Right. Um, yeah, when I first got there, I thought that I was going to go to law school. I thought that I needed to double major in communications and English very quickly. I was like, that's too much work. And so, and I decided not to go to law school. I decided not to double major in English. I just did communication studies. And that was all within like, you know, the course of a year. And I think the point you're making, I was 18. I was an adult, but still. Yep, exactly. I've changed my major, my desire for a major, maybe like four or five times. Yeah. So, I mean, how am I supposed to know, like, you know, with all of the, the lifelong consequences that come with these treatments, how am I supposed to have the actual ability to, like, know whether or not I'm able to accept the ramifications? And even, I'll just leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. But yeah. that, was, that was the point I was trying to make. Right. And what was the physical recovery from the mastectomy like? Um, it, so I had to sleep on my back a lot. I'm not used to sleeping on my back. And so I didn't sleep well for a while. So that, so for about a week, I had tubes in my chest to drain out. I mean, I guess fat or any liquid that was, uh, in there after the surgery, then I got the tubes taken out. Um, and so then after that, um, for a month, I couldn't put my arms above my my head. Like I couldn't lift my arms. Um, I couldn't really carry anything heavy. And then after that, like it was still. I would say the recovery process was maybe like six months, and I wow. lost also a lot of physical strength. And they don't say six months, and maybe it's different for everyone. But for myself personally, to really f- feel like myself again. Um, even though I didn't feel like myself, but physically speaking, I guess you could say, it's like about six months. Okay. And then you said pretty immediately after that, one, that you didn't want surgery again, two, that you didn't feel better, three, that you started dressing more femininely. So does this, after your mastectomy, does that kind of start the beginnings of your detransition process or did it take longer than that? Mm-hmm. So it took, it took longer it took a while for me to just say like, I'm a woman, like period, I'm a woman. But after the double mastectomy, a, a short while after I started saying, you know, I'm non-binary, I go by like he and they pronouns. Mm. Then it turned to I'm non-binary and I go by they pronouns. And then it was like non-binary femme. And I still go by they pronouns, but dressing like a woman, looking like a woman, talking like a woman. I just didn't want to accept specifically the fact that um, the removing of my breasts was a mistake. Mm. And, you know, I, I, I wanted to be an LGBT activist, like I said, and then I wanted to be a trans activist. So this was my whole world. This was my whole, this was like the whole of who I was at the time. So it was something that I I didn't want to let go, but eventually, you know, it, you know, for like in the midst of like everything that was happening with COVID, being isolated and um, being kind of separated from that community, um, was on. I really was able to to think consciously about all of these things, and you know, then start doing research for myself about you know the the other side. Um, you know, like, like the harms of transitioning and all of that stuff. And, and, you know, like different, different opinions that were out there, mostly, um, there were mostly radical feminist opinions at the time. Yeah. But that's when I really, when I started to see the research, I was like, wow, like this stuff is wrong. And it was in that time that I was able to say like, I'm a woman, that's it. And I was deceived and I was lied to. And I, boy, was I upset. <laughs> yeah. So this is stuff that you were kind of seeing online that made you kind of realize that. So, I mean, there was there were online forums that kind of made you think that your feelings of discomfort made you a man. And then it was also the research and the resources online that kind of made you realize, oh, wait, no, I'm not. And d- were you kind of like looking for that once you realized, okay, the surgery didn't help this didn't solve all my problems did you kind of go looking for okay well what's the other side of the story or was there someone in your life that kind of made you question 
Yeah, there was there was someone in my life actually. Um, there was someone that that I had started dating, um, and like he would tell me things. He's like, "Have you ever looked at the detransition Reddit?" So you were dating how, a guy how, at this point. Yes. Well, I I had been dating men the whole time. I had oh. been with men the whole time. Oh, I didn't. I, I was that. the. I, so I had entered a same sex relationship, and then at like eighteen and a half, um, I think it was when we broke up, and then from then on, I was only with men. Hmm. Okay. I, I would never, I would never be with women. Hmm. Um. Yeah, but so that that goes to show kind of some of the, the confusion. Yeah. Which honestly, it's a very normal thing. Like, you will see like trans men who are bisexual or gay, like, you know, it's actually something that's, that's pretty common. And I think that a lot of it is because, um, you know, like the fear of being with a man as a woman mm. was, was something that I, that I thought I felt, I guess, like, you know, if, if I was a man, I had some, at least some control over the situation, but I, I didn't, you know, I, I was raped. Um, I received death threats and, you know, after just, you identified as a man. Mm. Yes. yes. So it didn't solve the problem of making you not pray. No, I mean, it, it probably pushed it a little bit more, to be mm. honest. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it didn't solve the problem. Um, and probably pushed me even further into somehow in, in that warped mindset that I was in, continuing the transition process, I guess you could say. I mean, mm. I've never really thought about it like like this before, but you know, m the further I go along, the more masculine that I present and I act, maybe then these things won't happen to me. Yeah. Um, but I would have to maybe think about that that more before before saying that. Same, but I sure. agree. So there was a guy that you were dating that kind of made you start second guessing your what you thought was your identity. Yes. Um, it was just like some of the, the things he would tell me, like, have you looked at the detransition Reddit? Well, how does this and that make sense? It, mm. it was like these questions that no one had ever really asked me. Mm. And it, it just got me to, to just really start thinking. And so initially, like what I really thought, I'm like, I don't think the testosterone is healthy for me. Like I had actually been looking a lot into like um, the medical industry. And like I... I, I just really started to to question like is is it healthy for me to be on this much testosterone? I don't really know if I like how it's making me look physically, um, and and you know what will be the ramifications in the future. And so I got off of it, um, and but it was even after getting off of testosterone, it was still a process for me to ultimately realize like no, I'm a woman, and this whole system is just messed up. Yeah. Yeah. And so then kind of finally, what did it look like when you decided to go off hormones and like fully present as like the girl, the woman you are, go by she, her again? Like, what was that yeah. process like? It it was a really challenging process, um, mostly because, you know, I I I looked extremely masculine at the time. It was really hard for me to to go out and not be perceived as a man or even perceived as a trans woman. Hmm. Um, I got called an F A G G O T. I, I don't like using those words. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I got called derogatory terms. I had people just treat me, you know, horribly, and it was even more frustrating because it's like, well, I'm 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 like biologically female. Yeah, and now I'm experiencing the same thing I experienced while transitioning to become a man. But now people are making me feel deluded in doing what you know, like in being who I actually am. And it's like when when I'm put in the position, and especially if someone's being rude, it's hard to say like, "Hey, like actually, I'm I'm not a man. Um, I transitioned to become a man, and now I'm becoming a woman again." And they're like, "Okay, so you're a man," and I'm like. No. <laughs> like, so the like, same like, people that affirmed that like your original transition or the same kinds of people then gave you a hard time for actually like presenting as who you biologically are. It wasn't the same people. It was more like um like for example at a job or going out in public. Like the mm. people in my life 
like honestly throughout the whole time like i had some some friends in the lgbt community i did but at that point i had kind of cut everyone off mm. not even because of that necessarily but because you know they were they were doing negative things and it really hurt me to have to you know like drugs and and things like yeah. that and so it really hurt me to have to cut them off but I was in a place where I really wanted to better myself. And so I had to. So at the time, like with within my inner circle, there was no one that was against me um, detransitioning. In fact, they, they didn't really voice it at the time, but they were actually really happy that I was, mm. thankfully. Yeah. And tell me, this is 2020-ish, right? When you were detransitioning? Yeah. Okay. And then tell me about becoming a Christian. Like, how did you hear the gospel? What was that like? So that was actually pretty crazy. So um, immediately after um, transitioning, I was seeking spirituality, but not in the right places. And so I I had started with like kind of getting into new age stuff and, mm. you know, things that um, actually proved to be very harmful and ultimately just did not help me. Um, and so I was just looking like, I guess for me, I always just like wanted to know, like, why am I here? Like, there has to be a purpose to my life, a, a purpose as to why I'm existing. Mm. And especially with everything that I've been through, it's like, if there's not a reason, like, I would rather just die. You know, I was, I, I was even Baker acted uh, a couple months after detransitioning. I was extremely depressed. Sorry, what's I that? Didn't see... Oh, I said uh, that I was I was Baker acted. Um, what's that? A couple months. Oh, OK. Um. It's basically um, where you're forced, forcefully put in a mental hospital. Mm. I had self-harmed um, and I told my therapist and the cops came and they Baker acted me. So I spent three days in a, in a mental facility, um, which was horrible. It was, it, was, it, it was like literally the worst experience. And Specifically after that experience, I was like, I'm never telling anyone if I'm feeling bad. I'm, uh, if I'm feeling bad, I'm just keeping it to myself because mm. I'm, I'm never getting Baker acted again. Um, and so about two months after being Baker acted and, you know, unemployed, I had actually lost my college scholarship a couple years before. Um, I, I had graduated with a 3.7 GPA, 1360 SAT score, 50 college credits. I had $1,000 being given back to me in my bank account every semester, but I had to drop out because of all of the trauma and the stress that I was going through. So it's like- This is after I, transition? I, the, yes, that's after after transitioning. Yeah. So not even detransitioning, yeah. after transitioning, like yeah. six months after transitioning was when that happened. Okay. And so just sitting in the loss of everything, not just of my livelihood, but of my actual physical body, I was like, I, I literally felt like I had no reason to live. And so there was one day I was laying in my bed and, you know, like I said, like I, I would speak to God. I would say, God, please like help me with this, please. Like I need, I need this, like who even are you, you know? And so I, I, I prayed that I was laying in my bed. I said, God, if you're real, please help me. I, I like, I can't go on like this anymore. Um, and so about a month later, there was a girl on the detransition Reddit. Um, I had, I had posted about like wanting like, oh, does anyone want to start like a band with other detransitioners? Um, and so she, she messaged me back. And so we actually talked, um, we, we talked for like a few hours. And so she, she like, after speaking for a little bit, you know, she was a Christian. She felt led to talk to me about, about Jesus. And like, so, so like, I guess backtrack. So I, I hated Christians, you know, I, and not, not necessarily like with a pitchfork, like, you know, like that, but, you know, I felt like mostly like Christians hated me. Mm. And I felt like, you know, because of the perceptions that I have of, had of Christians, I was like, Jesus must not be real because I just felt internally, like I had an innate sense that God must be good. And from what I see, uh, in the example of other Christians, Jesus isn't good. Um, that, and that's, that's just what I felt. But Because you know, they like didn't, in, uh, Christians didn't affirm like your male identity. They yeah. didn't affirm transgenderism. So you kind of equated that with them being hateful. Yeah. And not even just the, the affirmation, 
Um, also, you know, things that I experienced while also being young in high school and experiencing same sex attraction, but just like things that I would see online. Again, I, I was the type to, to research. So I would like, I would look up and I would watch videos of like Westboro Baptist Church. Mm. And, you know, I would, I would look online and everything that I, that I saw was Christians are evil. Christians hate you. All, all of these things, not even just within the LGBT, but Christians hate women. Christians hate these people, Christian, you know, and which, which now, now we know, well, now I know is, is obviously a lie and that not all Christians are representations of who Jesus is. Um, but that's just kind of what, what I had felt for a really long time. Yeah. And so tell me a little bit more about, um, I think I interrupted you, your new friend that you wanted to start a band with. She started talking about Jesus. You hated Christians. And so like, what was your first impression when she brought Jesus up? I was like immediately intrigued. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because it was the right person to deliver the message. Cause you know, obviously she could relate to me as another detransitioner, but I don't know if it's cause God prepared me or, or what it was, or just like, I was just so desperate. I like immediately was like, wow, I find this very interesting. Um, however, you know, there there were people in my life, which I don't want to get very specific about, but there were people in my life that were like very against it. They were very against me becoming a Christian um, and, and you know, just getting, getting into God and all of that stuff. And so it was like a back and forth, like people kind of making me feel like I was crazy for believing that, that Jesus, you know, is Lord. Um, and so I would kind of go down that, okay, yeah, you're right. Maybe I'm just making it all up. Maybe what I'm feeling isn't actually real. You know, but then I would get to another desperate place and, you know, whether it be, you know, I would pray or, you know, whatever it was, I could feel God's presence and I would be shifted back. So it was like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for a couple of months, um, you know, un until there just came a point where, you know, I, I, um, I had just gone, gone through a breakup. And so after the breakup, I was literally like, I called my friend on the phone. I was like, I need to know if Jesus is real. I'm done with all of this back and forth. Like it, it's, I, I just need to know because if Jesus isn't real, like literally what is the point for me living? That's just what I felt at the time. Mm. Um, and then, you know, I, I just got to like a place and a point where I just finally surrendered because I was like, okay, Jesus, like the reality of you is too clear to me and I can't. I can't deny it anymore. And I'm tired of living, you know, the way that I'm, I'm living. I want to, I want to experience true freedom. And so I ended up giving, giving my life to Christ. Hmm. And while your friend was like sharing the gospel with you, talking to you about Jesus, were you reading the Bible? Were you looking at churches or was it just through your conversations with her that you realized that Jesus is the way? It was, I didn't go to church. Um, but it was conver it was conversations with her and also reading the bible and also just like just like god moments i guess i guess that's the best way to put it so like i can give one specific example that was very profound um so i've i've always sang you know i've always um i haven't always written music like written songs um but i i had started to around the age of 17 when i started experiencing gender dysphoria um because it was a really good outlet for me and so um, I, I remember God, he like, I heard him say to me, he said, my child, do not worry, strengthen your faith and everything will fall into place because of something that I was going through at the time. And I was like, I feel like this is a song. And so I just got on, I got on my phone and just started typing because that's what I would usually do when I would write a song. And so like, I, it took me like maybe a day to write it. And then I wasn't really conscious of what I had written. But then after, when I went to read it, I just started crying. Like I just broke down crying uncontrollably because it was like God in that message without me even understanding was speaking directly to me. And the fact that he actually did love me because mm -hmm. I always thought that he hated me, not because of, not only because of the, the things that other people would say, but because I was like, you've never answered my prayers before. So you must, you know, you must hate me. That, that's just what I thought, which is obviously a lie. Um, and it's so funny because I sent it to my friend and she started crying. She mm -hmm. was like, I don't understand how this song is so biblically accurate. 
yet you've never even really read the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. And tell me, since becoming a Christian, like, I, I know it's this is like, could be a whole other hour long conversation, but just give some examples of how kind of your thinking has changed, not just about life, but also like about the body, about gender, about like sex and relationships. Mm-hmm. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yes. So honestly, again, I feel like God had been really working on me to to receive the message up to that point. So at that point, honestly, a lot of viewpoints that I had once had had changed. My my viewpoints on on relationships, like um, for example, the importance of of it being you know a man and a man and a woman together um, as God designed, and um, regarding that, I mean, regarding just taking care of the body and like, you know, eating healthy, like I was really looking into um, certain, certain medical sciences that, that I thought were incorrect. Um, You know, my, my views on, on feminism, um, which obviously I, I, I don't, I don't agree with, you know, women being unfairly treated, but I also disagree with certain feminist viewpoints. Um, And one, one really big thing is saving myself for for marriage um and a person saving themselves for marriage and for marriage to to be the place where where sexual relations are had because i had a really bad sex addiction um during that time but after after coming to to christ like like it just it went away completely you know and of course like everyone experiences temptation but i no longer have the desire to to engage in that anymore um and also you know, one one really big thing. I think identity in Christ is very important. Um, I I um I also at the time was seeking therapy again, uh, secular secular therapy, and it wasn't helpful for me. Um, in fact, you could say that it made me worse in certain ways because, you know, like for example, my one of my therapists had told me she's like, if you feel like cutting yourself, you sh- you should just drink a bowl of soup, and I'm like how is drinking, you know, cause I, I like soup and I'm like, how is drinking a bowl of soup supposed to help me? Like I was losing my mind because it's like, how are these things actually helpful for anyone? Like I, I, I just couldn't understand it, you know, but now I've been able to find like through prayer and through, through the Holy spirit and through having a relationship with Jesus, I've been able to find true healing and true sanity. Um, you know, and, and not to say that, um, Christ-based resources, you know, when it comes to therapy and, and counseling and things like that are not helpful. I believe that it is very helpful, um, even though I haven't sought it personally myself. But I I think that o- true healing can only be found in Christ, in my personal opinion. Yeah. There are a lot of Christians that are listening to this podcast who have someone in their life at work or a family member or a friend who maybe they've transitioned. They think that they're the opposite gender and Christians are trying to navigate, okay, how do I speak the truth, not compromise on what I know is true, but also love them, share the gospel with them. And I want to hear your thoughts on that. But a specific question that I have is like the issue of pronouns. Like it's really hard for Christians when they are being told, well, if you don't use someone's proper pronouns, you are going to cause them to commit suicide or you're not being loving. But the Christian is thinking, okay, well, the Bible is really clear that God made us male and female. I know that that person, God, or that God made that person female, and I can't lie. And so they're kind of just like caught in this. They don't know what to do. So as someone who has been on the other side of that and now is on the other side of it, like how would you encourage Christians? How do, how do we engage in this in a way that is totally truthful and glorifying to God, but also is compassionate towards the people who consider themselves transgender? Yes. So I think that the number one thing to remember is that sometimes the truth hurts. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't think anyone should go out of their way to misgender someone and be rude. Um, and by misgender, but you mean like calling yes, a guy who believes that he's a girl, like calling him a man. Yes. Okay. So, yes. But I, I don't know if I could use an, another another word for it or or if that were, because it's not necessarily misgendering, but um, using the preferred pronouns of someone, 
if it's your if it's against your specific convictions and you know i mean it's hard to even say because there's only one holy spirit there's only one god there's only um one way but i do think that we can maybe navigate certain situations differently um what i would recommend like if it's someone uh let's say you know like let's say someone at work just use whatever name they're they're saying just just use the name as much as you can um but i think it's most important as christians for us to stand on truth because it's a bigger problem than just, you know, using the preferred pronouns of someone. The question is, where does it end? First, it starts with preferred pronouns. And, and then what? Are we legitimizing pedophilia? And I'm not saying that these people are pedophiles. Anyway, I'm, I'm not saying that people that are transgender are pedophiles. I want to make that very clear. But the moment that we allow and, and we accept these things in our society and we back up as Christians with the values and the personal convictions that we have, it allows room for this. Now, me personally, how I would go about the situation, um, you know, like speaking to someone face to face, I would probably avoid using pronouns um, in any way, just use the person's name. Um, but if it came down to it, and I really felt like God was telling me, you need to tell the truth, you need to be honest, and you can't just fold on this because you're afraid you're going to make someone feel bad i i would say it and of course it, it it's it is a really hard question to answer yeah. and i hope that i'm i'm answering it no it's well great. Yeah. um yeah i guess i would say don't go out of your way to be mean right. and do it out of like wanting to expose them um but if it but comes also, down to it don't lie yeah. Yes. Well, I've had I've had to do that before. Um, not necessarily. I mean, so when I first became a Christian, you know, I and I haven't encountered that many um, transgender people. Um, you know, I would use a person's pronouns, but there have been situations where I've I've had to be like, look, you know, I'm a Christian and I have my own viewpoints on this. Um, and you know, the, this is that's just how it is. And yeah, uh, it, it needs to be it needs to be respected. Um, yeah. And I guess it's more so than a problem with Christians. It's an issue with the whole gender affirming model of care, because when you know who you are, you don't need affirmation hmm. at, at the end of the day. Yeah, that's true. I think it does speak to kind of like the inner torment and insecurity about their identity that they are like forcing people even like punitively to, you know, use the what they would call like the correct pronouns yeah um tell me a little bit more about like the work that you're doing the nonprofit that you've started um the different things that you're doing to kind of like push back against like a very harmful ideology that really used you as prey in a lot of ways yes so um right now uh i'm in the process of actually um establishing the rainbow redemption project which is a name that that god gave me um, you know, basically the, the point is, is to, it's not even necessarily so focused on the trans issue, but giving people a path towards detransitioning and also helping people who have detransitioned really to find resources. Yeah. Um, there's really big issues when it comes to like, let's say housing, clothing, food, like basic life necessities. Um, speaking to different detransitioners, I've found that a lot of them are in very toxic home environments. And it's the same home environments, the toxicity that led them towards transitioning in the first place. Mm. So something that I'm very, very interested in taking on is a housing project. Um, nothing is necessarily in the works yet. Um, what we're, we're really looking to do right now is just establish ourselves. Um, as a nonprofit and gave gain the 501c3 status so that then uh, we can start working. Um, but also I, I may start to, um, in the midst of that, because I'm also about to start school, um, in, in the midst of that, um, posting YouTube videos and, and helpful, helpful guidance and resources. And I'm also interested in starting a Bible study with other detransitioners um, because I think that it's, it's a really big problem among people who detransition is that they detransition and then they have no hope, but they've they've had so many negative experiences with Christians that they're hesitant to even yeah. go to a church. So I would like to offer offer a place that it's like it's not a church, but it's also a place that you can learn about 
about God. And, you know, mo most importantly, what I desire is to help people to establish their own personal relationship. So like they, they at least in, in this process can learn how to have that, that, um, what is it that, that we say in the scripture, uh, to be founded on, on a rock, right? I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the exact words, but to found themselves on, on that rock. Um, mm -hmm. And just navigating, like being a new believer, it's, it's a lot. Like I've only been saved a year and thankfully God has helped me a lot through the process, but there's so much information out there. I also want to be able to, to, to help people kind of stem through that. But that's, yeah. that's the, the goal of the Rainbow Redemption Project. That's awesome. And can people find, is there a website? Can people find more information about it online? Yes. Um, I'm, we're actually in the process of, of getting our own domain. Um, Ali, if you, if you could put the, the link in the description, cause I don't remember exactly, sure. um, yeah. how, yeah, how it is. Um, but I will be putting the link in my bio of my Twitter account, which is, uh, Sophie speaks with, so Sophie, let me see. Sophie speaks with with two S's after the speaks. Okay. And if if you could put that as well. Yeah, definitely. You could find it there. And then you have a YouTube channel too. And what's that called? I don't have a YouTube channel. It was oh, uh, okay. Twitter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. For some reason, I thought you said YouTube videos. All right. Well, that is awesome. Well, I really hope everyone checks that out. Just follow you on Twitter. That sounds like the easiest way to kind of connect with you and to see what you're working on. Um, I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for telling your story. Praise God. God is a God of redemption. I loved hearing the um, how he kind of prepared you for hearing and accepting the gospel. He really kind of started like making the soil of your mind ready long before you were actually presented with the truth of Christ. And I love how God does that. When God do, is doing one thing, he's doing a million things, even if we can't see it. And um, I'm just thankful for your testimony. And my prayer and my hope is that he uses all of the objectively bad things that you have endured for good, for your good, for the good of other people, and for his own glory. That is what God does. And I have talked to so many people on this podcast alone who have testimonies like yours, whether it's about transitioning and detransitioning or other things that God uses and redeems the darkness for good and glorifying things. And I love that about him. So thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for your willingness to share, for your willingness um, for God to use you. I just appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. And I, I appreciate your prayers. And that's my same desire as well. And my my biggest prayer is to be able to be some sort of peacemaker between the Christian community and uh, even broader than the the trans community, the LGBT community in itself. And you know, I also pray that you know the message be received in the right way because I know that um, there are people who um, are currently transitioning who could see my message as hateful, and I would have seen it in the same way. But I would just like those people to know that there is true freedom in Christ, um, no matter how far. Um, a person is down the transitioning process. Amen. Um, and, and thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Amen. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.